Happy Friday, everyone. Hello and welcome. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Intentional Conversations podcast. We have been expecting you and we're so happy to have this opportunity to share space with each of you, this podcast community. I wanna take an opportunity to let you know that um, we have a great um, program that's actually planned for today. I cannot wait for us to get into conversation with our guest co-host. But while we give it just a minute for the podcast community to get settled into this virtual learning environment, I just want to um, encourage you all to take a moment to locate the chat and share with us where you're joining the conversation from. We always love to know where folks are joining the conversation from. And if you also feel inclined, share other information into the chat that you want this community to know. Oftentimes we'll have individuals to share their LinkedIn information and that lets us know that you are interested in being in touch with members of this community beyond our hour of time together today. And we really do value that. The chat is going to be our way of extending the conversations today. Yeah, so once again, if you're just joining us, please make sure that you find the chat. Let us know where you're joining the conversation from. I'm Dr. Nico White. I serve as the founder and lead principal consultant for NWC. And we are delighted to have you here with us for Intentional Conversations podcast, where we intersect conversations of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership and business. I am being supported today by my colleagues at NWC, and I'm so grateful for them. We missed you all last week. We had a staff in-person retreat, and so we're so glad to be back in conversation with so many of you. It is um, Holy Week, so I do want to acknowledge that for those who celebrate Easter and Resurrection Sunday. I know that many um, are actually taking some time off today in preparation for the holiday weekend. And so we will certainly hold space for um, any and everyone that is going to be part of our community today live, or even for those that may catch the replay later. But once again, welcome to Intentional Conversations podcast, a virtual community opportunity for us to be in conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion, intersecting DEI with leadership and business. Welcome again. Great. So again, if you're just joining us, we're so glad you're here. I'm Dr. Nika White. My pronouns are she, her, and I serve as a founder and lead principal consultant for NWC. And you have joined the Intentional Conversations podcast, where we intersect conversations concerning diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership and business. I have some exciting news that I know we have been promoting for the past couple weeks now, and I want to make sure that I continue to make you aware that the Intentional Conversations podcast is now soon going to be available in podcast format. And so for those of you who are really used to getting your content by podcast, this is our way of extending our reach to others um, to be able to be a part of these conversations. And so either um, receive that information for yourself or share it out with others that you feel are much more inclined maybe to be able to participate by way of podcast. And so I want to put that into your hearing. Also, for those of you who join us here at, at the Intentional Conversations podcast, you know that we often like to give you a heads up for what you can expect in future weeks regarding hosts that are going to be joining us. And I'm so excited because in April, on next Friday, we have Ola Nike uh, Mensa, And I'm so excited because she's going to be discussing the importance of integrating DEI into leadership development training and building anti-oppressive DEI businesses. And so really look forward to that. Hope you will enjoy, join us next week as we welcome Ola Nike. And then the week following that, we have a very special friend, and I call him a friend because he is a, a routine um, participant in our podcast community, and we're so grateful for him. So, um, Kobina Collins, Kwabana Collins, pardon me, Kwabana, we've been practicing your name, and I want to make sure I get it right. Kwabana Collins is going to be joining us also um, later this month as our guest co-host for today's, um, for the vodcast, and we look forward to hearing from him. Again, quite a um, usual participant um, in our vodcast community, so we're grateful. 
Now, it does me great pleasure to do what I normally do week after week, and that is give a formal introduction of our guest co-host that's joining us for that day. And today is my friend, Sarah Noel Wilson. So I'm going to give her formal introduction, and then I'm going to invite her to come on and share the spotlight with me as we're going to enter into conversation. She will greet you in her own way. Sarah Noel Wilson, with 15 plus years in leadership development, Sarah earned a master's degree from Drake University in leadership development development and a BA from the University of Northern Iowa in theater performance and theater education. No wonder clients love the energy she brings to their teams. Through her work as an executive coach and an in-demand keynote speaker, researcher, and soon-to-be author, Sarah helps leaders close the gap between what they intend to do and the actual impact they make. And by the way, not soon to be. Yeah, but... I was going to say, we need to update that. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, on us. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Presently an author, we're going to talk about your book today too, a good bit, Sarah, but I'm so excited for you. So you are also a certified in co-active coaching, conversational intelligence, and you are also a frequent guest lecturer at many different universities. In addition to Sarah's work with organizations, Sarah is a passionate advocate for mental health. When she isn't helping people build and rebuild relationships, she enjoys playing games with her husband, Nick, and cuddling with her baby, Seymour and Sally. And so I am so excited, Sarah, to welcome you to the Intentional Conversations podcast. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that I can bring you up front and center. And I'm going to also add the spotlight. I will let our guests know today that cameras are not required, but they are encouraged. And so if you're sitting back thinking, should cameras be on or not? I want you to know that they're definitely encouraged. We love to see smiling faces. But if you're planning just to participate today in an auditory capacity, that is fine as well. We're just glad you're here. But Sarah, I want to bring you into the conversation. First, my friend, I'm so grateful that you said yes to our invite. And I have truly, truly enjoyed getting to know you, following your work, supporting you, having you support me, which has been so tremendous. And I just, I just am grateful for, for all that you do. And I have been looking forward to our conversation today. So what I want you to do, Sarah, is now that I've given your formal introduction, your mm -hmm. accolades, your credentials, right, all the stuff that makes you qualified to certainly share your perspective with today's audience, I want you just to greet this group in your own way. And normally mm -hmm. what people like to share with us are things that we cannot know about them just by reading their bio. So help us get deeper connected to Sarah Noel Wilson. Welcome, my friend. Mm, thank you, Dr. White. I'm so, so excited to be here and help Hello, everyone. And what what a beautiful invitation to greet people how how you want to. I think, you know, in, in my moment, I just want to put my hand on my heart and say thank you. And, and so excited to to be here. You know what what I would share about <laughs> what what you should know about me. It's it's funny. My brain is going to a lot of places that are like, that's an interesting thing. Why, you know, like I want to tell a story about when I was two and my mom found me eating butter in the refrigerator. And why is that? That's not something you would find in my bio. Um, but something you should know about me is um, I'm deeply passionate about making the workplace work better for humans um, on a personal level. I'm part of the reason I'm passionate about mental health is because I have navigated for the last almost 10 years having panic disorder. I have a beautifully busy ADHD brain. And uh, one of the things that I do for self-care is I play the accordion. It's that's my that's my way that I, I navigate self-care is learn a, a really difficult, complicated instrument. And so I am the beneficiary of you playing the accordion because, um, for, for first of all, let me back up a second. Sarah and I connected, I don't know, maybe it was like a year or so ago. We were following each other, supporting each other on social media. I was really digging all of her content and she was frequently kind of commenting on, on some of my content. And we just kind of bonded over social media. You know how you have those BFFs on social media, but they don't really know that they're your BFFs. I mean, let's, <laughs> I mean, I know the moment that we bonded was because you, you, you were saying you were talking about how it's so difficult sometimes to find to find time to eat during the day and I was like oh someone else who struggles with that and I lovingly suggested that I could help remind you and myself to make sure we grab lunch that is but, absolutely but, but accurate clear, that was me because I really wanted to connect with you so I was just looking for the door in for us to, to build this relationship more deeply well it was a beautiful door that opened and I love you for, and I remember for quite some time after that, every so often I would get like a little, you know, tweet message or inbox message to say, Hey, did you eat today? And I was yeah. so grateful. I was so grateful. But anyway, beyond that experience, we deepened our bond, if you will, because I remember you shared with your um, Twitter community 
that you played the accordion and you you were you sent out an invitation really if anyone's looking for some kind of special you know playlist or something let me know I would love to be able to share this talent and I was like oh pick me pick me and you did and you sent me like two or three of yeah, the most the private beautiful concert <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. It was so awesome. And so you don't understand that will forever be mm-hmm. like embedded into my head and my heart because it was such a kind gesture and, uh, and I really enjoyed it. So, so thank you, my friend. No, but I want to hop yeah. and I want to hop straight in. The last time we had a conversation, the hour went by mm-hmm. way too fast. And um, so I've been bracing myself for today, knowing that it's probably going to be the same experience. So I want to maximize every bit of time that we have, Sarah. So let's hop straight in. I'm going to go ahead with a, a, a probably a, a tough question out of the gate, yeah. but I think it's so important to the message and the work that you do. So I want us to, to kind of frame our conversations today by addressing this question first. Why do you think people prefer being avoidant? Because mm. that's part of your platform and yeah. your message. So why and why is that important specifically to you, Sarah? Yeah. I mean, th- one word, it's protection. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when we avoid conversations, whether it's conversations with ourselves or with other people, it's coming from a place of conscious or unconscious protection, but I want to break it down because that sometimes can sound a little altruistic. What, what, one of the things that we've observed in, in the, the many conversations that we've been privy to, or people that we've worked with is that there's a number of reasons why we might avoid having a conversation that is emotionally charged, right? That's, that's the language we've been using lately. In, and, and, it, and it could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe culturally you were raised in a culture where um, having direct conversation was seen as disrespectful or dismissive. Maybe you were raised by a family like myself um, that, you know, I wasn't the first. Co- and, and just to be clear, my, my desire and passion for understanding how, how do we have the conversations we're avoiding was largely bar- born from the reality of I had never really experienced relationships or teams where that was the norm. And part of that was because I didn't know how to have the conversations when they became hard. So I don't speak from a place of expertise because I know how to have all these conversations. It's more from a passion of how do I develop my own skill? So, so, you know, so I I joke that I'm not the first avoider in my family. This is, I come from generations, generations, especially growing up in the Midwest and, you know, our, our Midwest nice, or I call it violent politeness, right? That, that like can I don't know if my microphone just cut out or not, but I heard it did just for a brief second, but you came right back. Okay. But, but we, but, but we also might um, avoid because of trauma. We might Mm. avoid because we've experienced a traumatic, uh, uh, we've, we've, we've experienced trauma. Maybe we, uh, when, when we did speak up or speak out, we were met with something that was painful. Right. So that's a, that's a big reason you know, there, there are certainly situations where, you know, we might avoid because we don't have the tools or skills yet. But one of the things, and I think this is really important to the, the, you know, the work that we're all trying to do is, and sometimes we avoid to protect power. You know, this is, this is something that, um, you know, we start to see because people will think, well, I avoid because I don't want to hurt their feelings. Well, it ultimately comes back to us, but, but that real, that reality that sometimes what we're, protecting isn't necessarily just ourself. It's our, it's our power, our access to power. Right. And so, right. so those are so, just some of the reasons that we see sort of consistently as patterns of why people might not engage in conversations that would be really important to engage with. Yeah, no, this is so good. So you mentioned trauma, you mentioned, obviously, sometimes just it could be just part of our culture. We know that there are certain cultures to where particularly women, they are, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of really expected to, to, to not speak up necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then you also mentioned just the lack of the know how the lack of the tools and the coaching. But then when you said, sometimes people are doing it to protect power. I think that is worth unpacking a little bit further mm-hmm. because I think it has so much relevancy to um, the the society that we live in, where um, even unconsciously keeping that sense of power becomes so important that it kind of fuels us and it prevents us, causes mm-hmm. us to avoid certain things. And I'm not sure if we're having that conversation as often as we should. Mm-hmm. So let's unpack that just a little yeah, bit further. Yeah. Say more about that, please. Yeah, I, you know, well... I, I want to like two things that are coming up. So the first is, uh, we, we, we avoid in a variety of ways. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm simplifying what's complex because humans are complex, 
But, but sometimes what we see is people do what, what we would call aggressive avoidance, which really isn't actually avoidance. It's just passive aggressive behavior, but it's like, we're not actually having, again, the conversation I need to with myself or with the other person. And I'm doing so in a way that is, is harmful or passive aggressive, um, that fearful or stress-based, right. Avoidance Mm -hmm. that comes from the paralysis. I know this is something I have to I have to continually work through is my stress right. default is, is to freeze. And, the, and then there are times, and I think it's important as we're talking about this, because sometimes in, in the land of, of, of when you're doing the work of how do we have conversations is sometimes we, we can't have the conversations or sometimes yeah. we're not ready to, or it's not safe for us to. And so, so we call that like conscious avoidance or conscious, mm-hmm. like, you know, not engaging, but that's different because we're coming from a place of choice and power. So this idea of protecting, I'll I'll share with you a really specific story of what, what opened my eyes to this. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, well, one, we know that conflict avoidance is one of the main characteristics of a white, right? A white supremacist culture from, you know, but I was working with a, a client and there was behavior that was happening on, on his team, um, by one of his team members. So he's the head, right? Mm. That, that I would describe as abusive. I mean, it mm. wasn't, it wasn't just kind of harmful or maybe maybe what was his intentions, but it was absolutely like, it was very clear mm. and no, nothing was being done to help hold him accountable. And I couldn't figure out, was it that he, this leader wasn't seeing it? Was it that he didn't want to see it? Like, I just couldn't get a sense on why wasn't there action being taken? Mm-hmm. So cut to multiple people leaving the team, right? Real high turnover, particularly, you know, by the women on the team, because they were the ones who were the, the, the target and the, and the, and, and the ones who were being um, unharmed. And, and a little while later, the, the, the leader reached out because the board was like, Hey, why is there so much turnover? And the focus shifted to him. Like, what are you not doing? And mm-hmm. as soon as the focus shifted to him, suddenly then he became very aware that there was a problem with this person. Mm. And, and, and that was such a linchpin moment for me because I realized it was like, oh, you weren't naive. You were choosing to ignore it because you were protecting what you had at the expense of um, literally the cost of team members leaving because they were, it was such a toxic environment for them. And so that was, that was one of my first revelations of, Oh, we do protect to protect our power sometimes. And, and so, so yeah, so I'm curious to hear what comes up for you as I share that. Well, and the reason that I said before, a lot of times it's unconscious is because I think having power is very comfortable to people who have power, you know, yes. oftentimes, because they're so conditioned to see that as how in which they navigate. And when it's taken away, it almost feels like something very significant is being compromised. Mm, mm. And so, and usually when we reach those points, it's easy for us to have, you know, these real extreme reactions. Like I'm just going to avoid it altogether and just ignore it, pretend it's not there. Yeah. But, you know, I think that's why from a DEI perspective, we often talk about, we have to choose courage over comfort, right? Mm -hmm. Because even as we continue to be self-aware and to educate um, ourselves on how others may perceive how we show up, it causes us to do better. When you know better, you do better, right? Yeah, and so, yeah. so I love the connection point to uh, bringing to the fore the significance of the self-awareness around, do we avoid certain circumstances or people or situations? Because I also know this, when one's psychological safety is compromised, avoidance is also one mm-hmm. of those characteristics. Mm-hmm. And when we think about a work environment, that's not the way. We have to be able to collaborate with each other. We have to be able to communicate effectively. We have to be able to have tools that we can leverage to help us, even when it gets difficult. Yeah. One of the times where I saw a huge shift, and it's not to say that it happened across the board, of course, but I saw a significant shift in people's awareness of not letting avoidance become their go-to was after George Floyd's murder. Mm. Mm. It was almost like it was so visual. It was so hard because it was everywhere. Everyone saw it, right? And I felt that it increased people's appetite to want to not to avoid it almost because they felt like we can't, even if we wanted to, we can't, right? And for those who did, there was so much criticism behind it. So it definitely can be compromising to a work environment or culture, to people's own psychological safety. If they sense that something that was so impactful to so many people, people are pretending it didn't happen, yeah. right? 
yeah. silence is a message as well. And it's not necessarily a good message. It's a message right. that's getting a lot of people in trouble if you don't really lean into that. Well, no, I was just going to say, I mean, that's, I mean, that's something, you know, there's two things that, that you said, you know, that one we talked about on, on our show together, silence is a message, right? Yes. And, and that courage over comfort. I remember attending uh, an event that you did with Minda uh, yes. Hearts, and you talked about, right, um, that nobody benefits from our caution, but everyone benefits from our courage. Yes. And that's, and that's one of the things from a place of, you know, a big, a big practice that, that, that we focus on in, in our work is curiosity. And curiosity mm. feels really simple. It can feel easy or benign, but, but, but to get, but to get curious when it's uncomfortable, to get curious mm. when it's hard, that's, that's what we're talking about. We're not just talking about asking, you know, um, questions or exploring simple things. It's what, why did it, this not matter to me before, right? When you talk about the George Floyd moment, like his murder and, and all the, the shifts that came from that. And, you know, we saw, and, and, and to be clear, these were questions that I was wrestling with. And I still have moments of making sure I'm checking and is, is, you know, it's the, oh, well, we need to hire a DEI person. We, right. I'll, I saw all of our clients move into yeah. action with that. And it's like, yeah. And, and, and we yeah. also need to spend some time getting curious about, and why, why wasn't that important before? Yeah. Not, not from a place of shaming, but from a place of owning and acknowledging. And so, so I think that that's a practice that is really important is like, we can't just, can't be just curious when it's comfortable. We got to yes. get really curious when it's uncomfortable and when it might be shedding truths that are hard for us to hear about ourselves, right? Especially mm. about ourselves. No, that is worthy of repeating. We can't be curious only when it's comfortable. Yeah, the best time to be curious is when we are trying to learn. Yeah. And so I so appreciate that. So let, let's now move into, because I know that you coach people around these, these skill sets, you provide tools. Um, so how do you coach or encourage individuals to address and combat um, avoidant behaviors? Yeah. What, what yeah. do you suggest? Well, I mean, so the first thing is, is, and it sounds so like, <laughs> you just need to notice, like notice a name that is happening because for so many people, and you know, I consider myself in this camp, it just became the norm that it didn't, I didn't even realize that that's what I was doing because that was just my default. And so being able to start to, because when we can see our, our relationships differently, and when we can see our conversations differently, then we can start to show up differently. And so even practicing on noticing and naming, oh, I think I'm avoiding something right now, or I feel like we're avoiding talking about something puts us into a place of choice. Mm -hmm. And, and, and one thing I will say is that, you know, whenever we talk about um, having difficult or emotionally charged conversations, one of the things that we hear is, no, how do I have it? So it's easy, right? How do I, how do I do it? So it's comfortable. So, so I feel more confident with it. And, and what we've learned over the work that we've done, and I know you, you know, it's in the work that you do, and especially in so many of the, you know, like I think about the different, um, you know, uh, what, I forget what you call them, but like the principles of what are we going to agree to? Yeah. Community agreements. Community yeah. agreements, <laughs> right. It's like, we, we, it's the goal isn't to not have discomfort. But, but for me, the goal is how do we not become paralyzed by our discomfort? How yes. can we be present with our discomfort? How can we observe, right, from a mindfulness perspective, the discomfort and still be able to have the conversations that we need to have? And so it's not as simple as do X, Y, and Z because every situation is different. But, Absolutely. Um, but part of, but, but some things that can work some of the times, right? I'm very, I'm very careful because, you know, whenever someone in a session is like, well, but Sarah, what about like, what would, what would you say or do in this situation? My response is always the same. It depends. Yeah, <laughs> it, depends, it does. It's very right? circumstantial. Yes. Yeah, so many it, variables, so many nuances yeah. that come into play. Yeah. But, but one thing, one thing I will say is that there, there definitely was a very consistent pattern of, of things that I was seeing people do or not do. So one was that it seemed uh, it wasn't happening enough that people were really getting curious about if I'm struggling in a situation to unpack, well, why am I struggling with this? They just sort of stopped at the emotion. I'm mad at you. I'm mad at the situation instead of digging deeper to go, but what did I, I need or what value of mine was being stepped on or because ultimately if we're struggling in a relationship, for example, it's because we have a need that's not being met. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we have, we have a, a value that's not being honored. The other, the other patterns that we we've observed is that it was really 
difficult for people to consider the other person's perspective, right? Because again, we're wired to protect ourselves and to make sure that we live and survive as this creature that um, getting curious about someone else and, and, and what makes sense to them was difficult. And, and then the, the, the last piece was um, not, not considering what role did I play or do I play in contributing to this. And so those are the factors for us that really drove um, how do we get more curious about ourselves? How do we get more curious about the other person? And then, and then when necessary, how do we have a conversation where we can get curious with them? And I, mm-hmm. and that doesn't, it doesn't apply to all situations. I always tell people curiosity is not a prescription. It's an invitation. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to mm-hmm. ask someone who's been harmed to get curious about the person who's harmed them. Right. Like that's, yeah. that's not, that's not where that's going to apply. But, but what we found is that it can help diffuse the heat. It can help us regulate our emotions when we can take a step back and go, okay, what's really going on here? Um, so that I can, again, come from choice to show up in a way that's really powerful for me or for what, you know, what, what, what I want to be purposeful about. I love the positioning of choice in this conversation. And you also said that um, it's not prescriptive, but it's an invitation, curiosity. Yes. And I think that to your point, there's never going to be a one size fits all, Mm -hmm. right? You know, solution. We have to be mindful. We have to practice good situational awareness. And through that, we're growing to be uh, even more effective when we have to have these tough, hard, delicate conversations that um, have to be had, though, because, you know, through that discomfort is where we grow. And so I, I love you bringing that to the conversation. I'm thinking back to um, the, the prep call and some of the conversations that took place as we were preparing for, for today. And you said something that really, that really struck. And it was, how can I not assume that I am always seen or always create safe spaces for people to have difficult conversations. And I think that's true. Sometimes we just automatically walk into spaces assuming that because I feel safe and I feel like I can have these difficult conversations, so can everyone else. And so, Sarah, from your perspective, how do we create safe spaces and how should we be holding ourselves accountable for how we show up to these spaces instead of just assuming that the space feels the same way for everybody? as it does for us. It, it, and, and boy, do we walk around with good intentions, you know, (laughs) and, 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 and the reality is, is as humans, we also have, you know, what I call shadow intentions. And there are times when, again, when we, we are showing up from a place of, uh, of self-protection, I, I, I think, especially, especially as leaders, and this is where we get into that, like, to be curious when it's courageous is, I don't want people I, when we're working with people and, and these are questions that I ask myself is instead of the question, am I making it safer? Aren't I the, mm-hmm. the more powerful question is what are the, like, what are we doing or not doing that might make it unsafe right. and to be willing to have the courage to ask that question and then to have the courage to actually answer it because other, otherwise we just, we walk around assuming. Now I will mm-hmm. say that um, I'm laughing a little bit because I've worked with some people who are like, well, I just, I just ask people, do you trust me? And I was like, <laughs> okay, so let's talk how about does that work out for you. Yeah, how's that working out for you? Like, <laughs> I bet they all say yes. I'm guessing yeah. most of them say yes. And probably yeah. a lot of them are saying yes with a smile. And that's not actually what they believe because the, the thing with the thing with distrust, well, trust is so complex. Yeah. But it's, and it's ever changing. And the thing that's so complicated is that distrust, the way I like to think about it is distrust is silently violent. Mm, if, 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 I, if I don't trust you, it's not likely that I'm going to be like, Hey, Dr. White, can we go grab coffee? You. I know. I really yeah. like, I walk on eggshells around you. I don't feel like you value me. Like, can we have this conversation? And so I think that sometimes, especially, you know, and I'm speaking because we work a lot with managers that we assume because we aren't hearing it, that it must not be true, but but you're hitting on another point, which is like, (laughs) if our culture is safe, safe for who, right? When, when like who gets to be safe. So your leadership team is made up of all white men. So they might be able to be safe, but if I'm the only woman on that team, let's have a real conversation about it. So I think some things like some questions we can think about is, you know, even just asking like, and, and, and sometimes I don't know if the word is safe because that's such a, 
it's a very personal word. It is but, right. But, but, and that looks different for, from person to person. Yeah, exactly. And so, so, and I, I hadn't made this connection. So bear with my brain is because your question is so powerful, but to think about what are those factors that we know contribute to psychological safety, yeah. that I can truly be myself, that I can ask questions, that I can take risks, that we can disagree. And so what would it look like to have conversations with being really specific to that of, you know, what is something that we could do differently or more of, um, that would make that you, that would make it easier for us to be able to have disagreements. Right. But again, as the leader, I have to be willing to listen to and own what their response is, especially if it has to do with behavior I'm doing. Um, and cause even the act of asking for feedback, I think is actually one of the most powerful ways to build trust because how I react to that with that person and around that person related to that feedback is showing them if I like that, I, that, that I'm somebody who you can disagree with and I'm somebody you can share critical feedback with that I'm somebody who, who takes that ownership and accountability because listening is not the same as taking ownership and accountability and then making changes from it. I so love that reframe. And I'm hoping that this audience is getting this reframe. What would make it easier to have disagreements? Because that is key. We cannot operate in these solid, healthy relationships, believing that what makes it healthy is because we always agree, right? Yeah, so yeah. we, and in fact, that is where the beauty and the magic of, of diversity and inclusion and belonging really takes shape is when we can have that, that healthy banter. You know, we call it at NWC constructive candor, right? Mm. We want to make sure that we all are, are feeling the agency to be able to engage Engage in dialogue that may not always feel great, but we know it's because it's coming from a place of we, we all really care about each other. We care about the work we do, the output. And so I love that. I often hear people use interchangeably use safe for brave, not, not what's going to make this a safe space, but what's going to make you be able to show up as your brave self in this space. And I think that's another good reframe because again, it goes back to what you and I are sharing, which is that Labeling a space safe makes assumptions. We don't yeah. know what safe looks like from person to person. Yeah. And, you know, again, to tie this back to this conversation of avoidance, people will avoid spaces where they don't feel safe, where they feel like they can't yeah. be their brave selves. And then therein lies, again, a missed opportunity because instead of trying to go through the discomfort and let mm. it grow us, we are avoiding it, right? Mm. And we, and it's like you said, we won't necessarily share if we have thoughts of not feeling that sense of trust and safety with our managers in the workplace. And so what we'll do is quietly work on our exit strategy, yeah, right? Yeah, so this is, this is a big conversation. I, I love that we're able to unpack this a little bit further. So I want to go to, well, no, you, you were going to say something. And I dare well, not. I was just going to, no. I was just, I mean, you knew this is what was going to happen. You I and know. I were just going to, I mean, <laughs> but I know. go for it. I think, I think <laughs> this, <laughs> I think that we have tolerated unproductive, unhealthy environments and relationships for so long that we don't even know what's possible. We all, like so many of us don't even know what it looks like to tr have true psychological safety because, because we might experience that with an individual. And I say this in full transparency of somebody who has worked with multiple teams. And then now in our work, right, we work with hundreds. I could probably count on like maybe one or two hands, the teams that I would say were the most psychologically safe. It's not to say that that, that safety didn't exist between people. Cause you definitely see that where you're like, oh, this is a team of 10, those two people, they, they can have that constructive candor. These people, right. they can have it, but like collectively. And I, and, and what makes me sad, what makes me so sad on multiple levels. And I'm not even talking about productivity for business. Cause for me, it's all about the people, right? Like there's, we don't even know how good it could be because when you're in relationships that are high trust, when you're in the relationships where exactly what you were describing, Hey, yes. I know you're coming from a place of heart. I also, you, you know, that if you call me out or call me in that, you know, that I'm going to sit with it. I'm going to reflect on it. I'm going to take ownership with it. I know you're going to do the same. It's magical when you experience that. And it's so yes. rare. It's so yes. rare. Yeah. I often say that accountability 
does not mean shame and it shouldn't feel like shame necessarily. If we're feeling shame in that moment, that is something that we are putting on ourselves, Mm -hmm. you know? And again, I do believe that there's a high level of responsibility, especially from leaders to make sure that they are thoughtful about how in which they're engaging in that constructive candor. Because the whole point of it being constructive is, is this useful? Is this helpful, you know? And so, but you're right. I often say too, that, you know, what we tolerate will continue. Yeah. What we tolerate will continue. And so mm-hmm. I think we need to also be, we, we need to be more empowering um, to, to the people that are under our leadership to help them feel that sense of agency of, um, and freedom of being able to have those, those conversations. I love that. I love that language. Of, I, I always love when you hear somebody say something a little different, you're like, oh, that's burned <laughs> into my brain and I'm probably going to be <laughs> quoting you. And, and to understand that what we tolerate, that's actually what we're saying we value right? It's like, I don't care about the words on the wall, but like our hidden values is what is what we're willing to like tolerate. And so, you know, I was working with a, a, a a leadership team just recently that, that is very, very avoidant of having, um, what I would consider benign, difficult conversations. Like I don't say that to dismiss them, but we're talking about, you know, a performance conversations at a very sort of fundamental level. And like, I hear that you want to have, say that you value, right? Like collaboration, but what, what are you actually valuing? What we see you valuing is, is complete avoidance of conversations. Like that's, that's, that's a, that's what you're prioritizing right now. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So all of these messages, whether we realize we're sending them or not, we are, and they do make a difference. So we have to be very mindful. So I want to shift a little bit. And by the way, we are going to, and and Bobby, about the next five minutes, um, take audience questions. And we invite you to share those questions by either raising your hand and we'll call on you to unmute yourself and present them live. Um, Or if you um, would like to just place them into the chat, we're happy to present those questions for you. Um, But I want to, I want to address one other question at this time. Um, We've all also talked about the experimenters mindset. And I want you to share with this audience, what is that? And how can we embrace it? And why it's important to embrace it in the context of this broader conversation that we're having? It's, I mean, we we are living in the greatest adaptive challenge of our time. And when I talk about adaptive challenges, adaptive challenges aren't things that have quick fixes. They aren't things that we might be able to solve with current authority, or maybe we can solve pieces of it, right? But it, 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 it requires a changing of habits, of values, right? And it's, there's, no, there's no one, one door in, one door out. And, and anytime we're in communication or with another human, there's something adaptive about it. And so the idea of embracing experimentation is, is just a willingness to say, there's so much we don't know. There's so much like there's things we have figured out, but there are things that we don't know how to maybe connect the dots between where we want to go and what we know now. And there's a tendency and I get it. It's our brains, our brains desire to want to make things simple, right? Like we can solve all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion problems. As long as we have an unconscious bias training, like check, Mm -hmm. that's a technical fix for what is a really complex adaptive challenge. And one of the ways that we can start to build up our muscle of, of really tackling these complex, uncertain, you know, like complex situations and challenges is I, I think of it like, a, a you know, a tangled up ball of Christmas lights that has multiple strands in there, right? There's no like, oh, just pull on this one and it's all going to come out. No, you just, you start pulling and sometimes you pull and it tightens things up. Yeah. And sometimes you pull in it unloosens it. And, 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 and that's true even in conversations of, because there's no script it's, there's no, there's no perfect script. That's going to get you from a to B because you're dancing with a different partner, right? All of the different internal and external factors, but it is just this like ongoing experiment of I'm going to try this or I'm going to, try, Oh, that didn't work. Okay. Like I'm going to adjust this. And, and there's a lot of discomfort, um, there's a lot of discomfort uh, in our and what we see in in, in, in corporations, uh, when, you know, with people of of willing to embrace the experimentation, um, mm-hmm. which is it's just such an important it's it's a non negotiable now because we are you know when people I mean I'm taking us off topic a second but how many people how many companies are like how do we do hybrid. I don't know. We're all figuring it out together, right? How do we make fundamental, you know, changes to culture? Well, there's some best practices and some of it's going to be unique to you and your culture. And we have to just be willing to test it and to try it. 
um, and to sit with the discomfort of not knowing and to sit with the, you know, and I know this is an agreement of yours that is such an important one is to sit with the, the, the comfort that we might not have this a resolution, right? We may have non-closure, um, but can we keep testing and trying things so we can keep moving forward? Um, and, and, and the other thing I'll say to that um, is, you know, one of the things that I think we have to be so aware of personally, but also uh, when we're working with people, is this idea of regulating heat. This is language we'll use of sometimes we need to turn the heat up a little bit, right? To make changes. Yeah. Sometimes maybe we need to have the hard talk, the hard truth to raise the heat to say, oh, I need to do that. And then there are times when we, we need to make sure we don't burn people and we have to, and like we're constantly dialing ourselves and other people, right. As we're navigating such, such complex situations, but I don't want, I never want people to be afraid of the complexity. I, I, you know, cause I'm sure sometimes people are like, Oh, well, I don't know how I, how can I change this whole, you know, system of oppression? Like, right. yeah, we can't be overwhelmed by it. We just have to keep doing what we can to try to untangle it so we can make it better. This is so good. I love your analogy of um, the Christmas lights. I think we all can probably, you know, think about, you know, the the complexity of that, you know, like this big ball of, of yarn. How do we unravel it in a way that leads us to emerge stronger? And I think that um, it also places emphasis on the curiosity first approach that we were talking about earlier. We have to be willing to experiment and we have to go into these circumstances knowing that we may not be able to have the full closure, like you mentioned. Mm. So oftentimes, so we deal with like community agreements that we referenced earlier, one of which is expect and accept non-closure. Yeah. We're probably going to be able to resolve a lot maybe in this conversation, but then we also are probably going to be able to walk away where we still have lots of curiosities that we're continuing to follow and to learn about. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. We have to give ourselves permission to be okay with not having full closure every moment that we yeah. expect to have full closure. Sometimes it takes time yeah. and that's okay. And, 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 and why do we want closure? closure because it makes us feel comfortable. Yes. Right? And Goes like back to and that courage over it comfort. Does, yeah. it, because it makes us feel comfortable. And 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 the situations we're navigating right now, they weren't they didn't happen because of one conversation and they sure as hell aren't going to be solved because of one conversation. Yeah. And absolutely. Uh, yeah. So well, I want to give the audience a chance here. I have so many more questions that I can jump to, but I dare not monopolize um, all of our time just with my questions. And so if you have a question or a curiosity that you want to follow right now with Sarah, um, as we're on this topic, feel free to raise your hand or place it into the chat. I will love to be able to spotlight someone to join our conversation today. I'm just looking around. Um, Kwabana. Thanks so much, our upcoming uh, um, guest co-host. We are going to bring you to the fore, but love for you to share with us at this time. Hi, Kwabana. Thank you. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good morning. Good morning. I love your pieces. If you hear a little noise in the back of my multitasking, doing a little walking. Um, uh, so something that you talked about as far as like uh, closure, you don't just talk about <clears throat> why would you want closure and why uh, how that makes comfortable it's not necessarily a question but it just made me think about closure as you've checked that box right yeah. and then you can move on and you don't have to maintain it so uh well i guess the question would be how do you propose that um companies and organizations as they quote unquote check the box continue to maintain that new change because a lot of times it's easy to slip back into old habits right instead of um that cons- consistent continual um, monitoring and revisiting of those things, you know, it's like that, the concept that you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. So you did it that one time, you know, we've all gone to the team retreats and we make these beautiful graphs and charts on the walls that we did uh, when we got together and use paper and, and markers, but, and then you get back to the office and you never really pull that information up again. Yeah. So how do you propose that organizations maintain that new norm or maintain that progression to a new more uh, inclusive norm yeah no no thank you thank you for that that question and i and- Oh, go yeah, ahead. And Sarah, if you don't mind, I was just going to quickly share, if you yeah. don't mind just kind of succinctly restating the question, it was a little yeah. hard to hear. So I want to mm-hmm. make sure this audience has the ability to get the essence of the question. Yeah. So, so how do, how do we, how do we help organizations maintain, sustain and maintain the efforts that they're putting towards for some type of, of behavior change, mindset change, cultural change, 
um, is how I would summarize it. One is helping people understand even just understanding learning and understanding behavior change. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time with organizations, not just on that, that like how to do something, but to understand how do we actually learn and to notice and be able to name some of the traps we might fall into. So we, I mean, like, you know, they call it homeostasis, right? It's like our natural human tendency that we, well, we stretch now we want to go back to, to what was familiar. So some of the, some of the, the practices that we, we work on with, with uh, organizations is one is even just understanding the difference between a technical problem and an adaptive challenge, because we want them to be able to diagnose it so that they can sit there and go, oh, right, this isn't going to be a check the box thing. Um, the other, you know, some of the other things that we found to be effective is um, it, it's, we call it work avoidance. So this is something that I want leaders to always be on the watch out for of we said this is important. And what are the things we're doing or, or not doing that's actually like us avoiding the work. So, you know, from a DEI perspective, well, DEI and any one of the most common work avoidance techniques organizations do is they develop committees that don't actually have resources or authorities, right? It's and so 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 part of it is is working with leadership teams, not just to um, talk about content, but to really understand behavior change and behavior shifts. The other thing that I will say that, that we have found in our work that has helped, um, that, it, that, is, that is tr like created the most long lasting transformation. And this comes from the work of immunity to change. So this was, this was born out of, of work from Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy is that so often, right? We go to those retreats, like you were talking, we go to those retreats, like, yeah, we feel good. We're going to do this. And that's our foot on the gas. But again, if we don't take time to audit and have the real courageous conversations around and what are we doing or not doing that's getting in the way, that's our foot on the brake and unpacking that through the lens of, and what assumptions might we be making that's driving that behavior? There's a, there's a beautiful uh, uh, practice around that. And uh, uh, I like to, I want to, I can't see the note I called that the placebo. There's yeah, it's, uh, um, but to really do the work of not just, oh, this is fun and we want to do this because here's the thing with behavior change that even when it's urgent, even when you know what to do, even when it's important, it's really hard for us to, to make movement on that if we aren't also aware of what we're doing that's getting in the way, right? There's interesting research that says that only one in seven people will actually make behavioral changes when, the, when they have heart issues. Literally, their life depends on it and they still aren't doing it. So, so helping teams understand that. And then one of the strategies is really unpacking what are we doing that's getting in their way. Yeah, I love that. What are we doing or not doing that's getting in the way? Such an important question. Again, these reframe of these, these simple conversations that we're having, I think can be really useful as a starting point to, to go deeper into this work. Um, so Tracy has her hands up. So Tracy, I want to give you an opportunity to come and share. Yes, thank you so much. I'm enjoying this conversation. Um, I want to go deeper into what you said about the intensity. Um, you, you called it heat. Mm. But I, I like to think of it in terms of levels of intensity mm. and mm. people's willingness. If you have a, if you're trying to do something where you're having courageous conversations in a group setting, for example, like a dialogue, and you have people at different levels of comfort, is there a way to sort of level set where the ones that want to lean in are, are are still engaged, but the others that are at different stages that aren't ready for the conversation? How do you manage that? Thank yeah, you. So no, good. thank you. That's such a great question. Yes. And, and Tracy, I mean, that just hits to the complexity of humans. You know, it's like, this is a, a, this, a metaphor that we use to think about it is my oven is uneven. When I cook cookies in it, one side gets burnt, the middle side is good and the other side stays doughy. And the problem is that all of us have different temperatures, right? As we're in this oven. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always thoughtful of like not providing a, oh, just do this and it's going to solve everything. But, but if, but if, but some strategies that I found that can work in that situation is even just talking about it as beautifully as you just did of like, Hey, we, we, as we explore things, we know that people are going to be on different, you know, different continuums related to 
it, it, well, one way to think about it is protection to partner. Um, there's, there's, there's a practice of conversational intelligence and there's a dashboard we use of like, am I in resistance mode or am I in, in a collaborator mode? And, and, and we work with people to be able to name and own that it's okay that you're in a resistance mode. Well, it's not okay. I want to be clear. There are times when it's okay that I'm in that protection mode, but to be able to name it. One of the, one of the, one of the things that's really um, important for us to be able to build again is that, that mindfulness and that awareness of, of, of our emotional reaction so that we can start to regulate it. And one of the, one of a strategy that you can use is um, uh, think of it as like dance floor balcony, um, right? When we're on the dance floor, we can only see what's in front of us, but if we get on the balcony, we can see the bigger picture. Yeah. So sometimes when I notice the heat is all over the place and it, this is an intentional way to drop the heat, but to invite people to um, start to pay attention to what's happening. It's just like, hey, I'm on the balcony right now. I'm noticing that we have some people who are really quiet. We have some people who are, you know, sharing a lot. What are you observing in the room right now? What are, what are you noticing in yourself? And, and trying to create a space for people to be able to speak what they're feeling. And now you can imagine this isn't always easy, but it's always powerful um, to be able to navigate that. But it's, um, it's challenging because especially when if we're talking about topics that are so that we're so passionate about and we know are so important that when somebody totally shuts down and they're not able to like emotionally regulate themselves, it can be really, really difficult and frustrating. And so, so, so working, working with ourselves and with other people of like, how do we notice when we're having a stress reaction, right? How do we, how do we start to be like, Oh, my amygdala is hijacking right now. Like, how do I notice that? And from a facilitation perspective, um, Right. Like, how can we get on the balcony to just all start to observe? What am I observing in myself and what am I observing in the group right now? Um, that's that's a that's been a powerful tool that we have found to be able to navigate those really difficult moments. I see. I just want to say I so appreciate that question. And there's so much we can say about it, but it's such an important question. And it's one that I know as a, a practitioner, we hear all the time. You know, organizations will say, we want to pull this group together to try to help create some alignment around why are we even doing this work of DEI? But we know that we have some people that are maybe resisting because they don't understand it. Then we have some that just don't think it's necessary. They think it's more of a distraction. Then we have some that feel like we aren't, you know, moving fast enough in this work. So you're trying to hold all of these things, and it can really be a delicate balance and mm -hmm. quite tricky. But one of the things that I have found, and Sarah, you kind of touched on this, is providing a language, a common language that people can use as they're introducing where they feel like they are to help others also know how to best engage them, you know. Mm -hmm. And you set the dance floor and the balcony, but there's also the basement. There's some people yeah. who are oh, oh, Dr. Boy, you're bringing it. <laughs> You're not even close, right? It's like, <laughs> I, this is so non-existent in my world right now that I, I can't even fathom a, a curiosity to be yeah, able to follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and curiosity And that's real for privilege. some people too. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, mm. we're running out of time. Linroy, mm. I see your hand up. I want to bring you to the conversation. I'm going to spotlight you now, sir. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thanks. Um, thanks, Dr. White. And also thanks, Sarah, for being here and, and really um, having this conversation. My um, question deals with, you, you've talked about the coaching, the, the, some of the training in organization and, and also kind of counseling and kind of getting people to the point to be able to have these conversations. But my approach has been um, right now doing and hosting some book conversations. Mm. I know you have a book, Don't Feed the Elephants. Mm. Um, are there other books that you have started out with at the beginning that you've read, reviewed, et cetera? that would be good tools to have conversations. I have my own short list, but yeah. I'm interested in picking your brain on that because we do a great job, I think, analyzing and kind of talking about the problem, but the, this particular problem, I really want to put a conversation out in the atmosphere here in the United States and globally to have that conversation that when people leave, they actually have some of those um, tools. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, 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 well, you and I should swap lists because I would be curious to know what's on your list. I, I, there's so many books that are coming yeah. up for me, but I mean, I mean, cause but in, in, uh, the, the first thing that came up for me that isn't necessarily a, a toolkit per se, but I think it's a really important conversation is a book called mistakes were made, but not by me. And it's a book about cognitive dissonance. 
and, and even having conversations about things like that, right. To, so we can understand because, because if I, I, you can give me all the tools in the world to have the conversation, but if I, if I don't understand fundamental things like emotional regulation, if I don't understand cognitive dissonance, bias, all of that, um, yeah, crucial conversations, difficult conversation. You know, it's funny. I'm like, I'm looking at my, 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 you know, uh, conversations worth having is a really good one. Um, this, this one is really good. I, I've never been able to pull from it, but it's thanks for the feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, the, um, that's, that's really powerful. And, and, and again, I I'm always, I'm just, I'm such a, I'm such a proponent of, we get a lot of how to's, but if we don't understand why we do what we do, that's gets in the way, then it doesn't matter. But, but I'm with you, Len Roy, from the standpoint of we do need tools and words. And, and, and I, maybe I'll share this with you, Dr. White, but we just did a, a session yesterday where it's like, sometimes people think, oh, the reason I'm not having the conversation is I don't have the words. Yeah. And like, that's the tip of the iceberg. Well, but we're also not having conversations because of your emotions, because of their emotions, because of expectations, because of power dynamics, because of fear of retaliation, yes. because I'm afraid I'm going to run into you at target. And then what the hell is that going to look like? Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so I love, I love Len Roy that you approach that through that, that, that lens. And I, I want to think more about this so I can maybe send you some things that, um, uh, yeah, I want to be really thoughtful about it, but I, I really, a book for me that was really powerful was, yeah, mistakes were made, but not by me to just better mm -hmm. understand cognitive dissonance and realize like, oh boy, do, are we real good at saying this is how I view myself, especially, you know, as a white person, right? I, view, I like, I want to be a good white person and like realizing that I have to really check that and check all of that belief around that for me to step in, to do the work that I need to do. And just a quick follow-up is yeah. when you begin to look at in this space, the, the leadership area, because we, we are real good at selling leadership, mm. tons and tons of speakers, books, mm. conferences, but the thing that typically is missing is this. Mm. And so I know I've had some in my kind of cl close circle of friends that will say it an author name and they love them and I'll challenge on what are they doing for your community? Yeah. What are they doing to, 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 to change, to, to move the needle? Yeah, um, people are like, that's not true. That's not true. And then they come back later after really looking at it from a different set of lenses and go, how did you see that? Mm. But to me, they have a responsibility because this is a leadership mm. you know, issue challenge that we have to overcome. But thank you for the question. And thank you. Um, I look forward to connecting and getting your list and I'll share yeah. that. Mine is short. I've been very stingy with it. I, I, I want to have a book conversation about it. I would love that. And the other thing we have to realize is that especially when it comes to and, you know, and I understand that, that, that I wrote a book and I've added to this, but that most of the books on difficult and crucial conversations were written by white people, largely white men. And that's a very different dynamic. You know, when I have, when I have mentors who are like, well, you should just say it. Well, here's the thing. Like, it doesn't usually end well for me when I tell a man, no, like that's what I've learned. And so how I approach that conversation is going to be very different than how you approach it. And so I would, I would absolutely welcome, because I'm continuing to try to find like, how do we listen to different voices? Because it's, there's so many different, I mean, in the intersectionalities of how we show up in these, these moments and conversations, it doesn't look the same. We don't all get the same benefit of the doubt, you know, assuming good intent isn't applied to everyone, right? Like there's, there's so many different factors. So thank you, Len Roy. So good. Thanks so much, Lenroy, for your question and for, for joining us um, week after week. We always appreciate you being a regular here in our podcast community. So we are so running out of time. There is a great question in the chat, though, that I do want to bring mm. your attention to, and it's from um, Sharon Long. And I'm hoping that maybe the two of you can connect. Um, I'm going to ask my team to please make sure that your LinkedIn information um, gets shared into the chat so that um, Sharon and maybe others can reach out to you with any um, further questions that they may want to dialogue on. But I want to make certain that this audience gets an opportunity to hear a little bit about your relatively newly released book, which I'm so excited for you. Don't Feed the Elephants has been referenced a couple of times today. Give us a premise of what the book's about, who is it for, and how could it really help create value around this broader topic of healthier conversations and dialogue? Yeah, it's my love letter to my fellow conflict avoiders. <laughs> it's, you know, somebody said, who'd you write it for? I said, clearly myself, you know, and my, <laughs> um, but it, uh, when I started my journey of exploring this idea of how do we create cultures and relationships where 
either the elephant in the room doesn't come in or it doesn't hang around long. Um, I realized, again, similarly, there is already all these amazing books on how to have the conversations, but people were going to trainings and they still weren't doing it. And it's like, well, so why? So that's, that's when I became really interested in the avoidance side of it. And so I would say that the, the big part of the book focuses on just how do we understand our avoidance? How do we understand why it happens? And, and again, how to come from a place of choice, because I don't think, I don't think you should just call out the elephant. I don't, I think there are times when it, it isn't safe and it, and maybe I don't have the mental energy or maybe it's just not worth, worth the battle to me, um, to explore that. And, um, you know, and I'm, uh, and, and, and I'll just say this. And so, so we talk about strategies. We, we explore the curiosity first approach. We also introduce, you know, very technical terms like avoid a fin and imagine a fin and all the, you know, elephants we create. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, and I also just like, just a, cause I mean, from a, a standpoint of inclusion, right. One of the things that was really important to me was to, to write a book that would be easy for anyone to read. And yeah. so we designed it very intentionally with a neurodivergent brain in mind, like my mm-hmm. own. Um, so hopefully you see that when you, when you read it, but the, the yeah, so the, the book is really focused on how do we start to understand and name, no, like notice and name our avoidance and start to, to show up more powerfully. I, I will say this, I, uh, I would love to be in conversation with any of you, you know, my DMS are always open because I, every conversation, I learn something different. I show up, you know, right. So it's, it's a gift when we can talk about this stuff and talk about the hard stuff together. Um, just because I think our, our world needs to be having a lot more conversations than they are. And uh, especially over the last two years, there's been such an erosion of relationships that it's really yes. important we figure out how to rebuild and heal heal that. Yeah, no, I, I Sarah, that's a great note to end on. We could talk for I know at least another hour I'll just and have really you on dig my deeper. Show again. Well, I, I would absolutely love that. We would love to have you back as well. There's lots of great commentary that's happening in the chat. So this conversation is definitely resonating with our audience here. And we're so um, grateful that you said yes to our invite. Um, again, we have shared um, Sarah's book into the chat. We also have shared her LinkedIn information. And I do hope that many of you will take Sarah up on her offer to connect and, and continue the dialogue. A quick question, is the book available on Audible? Said it's it's uh, it's coming. Yes. I'm, I'm listening it's coming to the this final, summer. final edit this weekend so it takes a few months once we do it but yeah it'll that be is great are you narrating it yourself i am and only okay. because my publisher was like really <laughs> defiant that an author shouldn't because there's such an art and a science and i said well how does it make you feel to know that i've done professional voiceover work and i have a friend who owns a studio they're like okay we'll let you know. we'll, we'll let you <laughs> that's off great yeah. that is great well sarah thank you so very much and thank yeah. you to all of you who have spent time with us on this friday we do hope that you have enjoyed our time together today and that you will share this um that cuts out with others in your community that you feel like would gain value from being a part thank you all so much have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next friday take care bye everyone bye